First, let me say I stand before you stronger than this time last year, by a lot. So thank God for that. Thank you for that. Thank you. But what about you? Why don't you take a moment and find someone behind you, in front of you, whom you don't yet know, and introduce yourselves. It would be such a shame to leave today without meeting one new fellow congregant. The question we ask when we read the Akedah, these haunting words of the binding of Isaac, is how could Abraham have raised that knife? How could he have dared? Only because he trusted that God would intervene. To the very last moment, he believed that God would keep the promise made yet many years before. He knew Abraham believed with certainty that God would spare Isaac in order to fulfill the covenant struck under that night sky long before Isaac was born, God said to Abraham then, Habet na hashamayma, please turn your eyes, gaze heavenward, usfor hakochavim, and count the stars if you are able to count them. Ko yihyeh zarecha, so shall be your offspring. God would not cut off Abraham's line before it could take root, Isaac had to live, he had to survive. And so Abraham could not hesitate when God called. There was no reason to hesitate. He could take his son with confidence. He could take up the wood and the fire stone without hesitation or doubt. He could climb Mount Moriah with steady steps. He could build the altar with confidence. He could bind his son. He could even raise the knife with unflinching faith. And so he was rewarded. It is written, then out of heaven an angel of God called out to Abraham a second time, saying, by myself do I swear, says the Eternal One, that because you did this thing and did not withhold your child, your only one, I will bless you greatly and make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven and then the promise is expanded even further. The sands of the seashore, your descendants will take possession of the gates of their foes. And through your descendants, this is the greatest promise of all, through your descendants, the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you hearkened to my voice. The covenant is reconfirmed and expanded. Isaac will live and will grow to be a father of a great people known throughout the lands, known throughout the ages for his capacity to bless. Like Abraham under the starscape of the night sky, like Abraham with feet on the seashore, we also count. Every Jewish child is as treasured as a star, a twinkling light, a sign of God's enduring covenant. And oh, how we worry about them. We construct and conduct study after study, and we analyze the numbers, and then we analyze the analysis of the numbers. How many have we lost? How many have we gained? We are 14.2 million Jews worldwide. I remember when living in Israel, the news broke that the Jewish population of Israel had crossed the threshold of six million. There was celebration in the air. Some celebrated the news as the ultimate triumph over Hitler. Some celebrated the news as evidence that God remembers the promise that was made to Abraham, Zohar Habrit, God remembers the covenant with our people. Truth be told, while Jewish population is growing in Israel, we on this side of the ocean could do better. Our numbers are decreasing. Jewish life is flourishing, of course, but there are fewer of us to enjoy it. And there likely will continue to be fewer of us. 
Holy Blossom Temple's membership, I'm proud to say, is growing strong again, thank God. But all congregations everywhere, including ours, have to work very hard at creating Jewish life which is attractive, which attracts. And so today, when we recall the commitment Abraham and Isaac made as the first Jewish parent and child who launched a chain of 4,000 years, on this holy day when we reconfirm the covenant we hold with the God of history, I want to acknowledge two circles within our congregation who have a very important role to play in this story. The first circle are the converts among us. How many of our families have been strengthened by the arrival of a Jew by choice? Who among us is married to someone who chose to become Jewish? Who among us is someone who chose to become Jewish? Who is a child or a grandchild of a convert? Who is a parent-in-law or a sibling-in-law of a convert? These good people have woven themselves into the fabric of the Jewish people, and they are a part of what drives us towards a Jewish destiny. Converts have always been a precious gift to the Jewish people, but especially today, they are an infinite blessing as they help to build and strengthen our people. Surprising then that we barely speak of it. When someone converts to Judaism, of course, they are Jews. So we don't distinguish between one and another, between one who is born to a Jewish mother and one who chooses to emerge into the mikvah waters. But I feel today it is important to publicly acknowledge the unique sacrifices and the unique contributions, the gerei hatzedek, the righteous converts among us, make. Not only do they, do you, strengthen the numbers of our ranks, but you who are brave and generous souls enrich the Jewish people in ways that we recognize and ways I'm sure we don't even yet recognize. Said Resh Lakish in the third century, converts are more beloved to God than the Jews who stood at Mount Sinai. The reason is that those who stood at Mount Sinai may not have accepted the Torah if it had not been for the awesome spectacle of thunder and lightning, the great wind and the sound of the shofar. In contrast, converts saw none of this, and nevertheless they came in time to cling to God and to accept the Torah. Could any be dearer than these? One Talmudic teaching goes one step further, explaining that although converts cannot say their ancestors stood at Sinai in body, they themselves were present there then in soul. That is, the souls of every future convert was at Sinai. It just took that soul some time to be born into a body that would one day walk in the direction of the Jewish people, walk into the direction of a synagogue and discover what could be for them. This is a beautiful teaching. So dear congregants whose souls we're at Sinai, but it took soul searching to realize it. Let me say today on behalf of the congregation, we thank you. We honor your commitment. In fact, we are inspired by it. You remind Jews who were born Jews just how good is our inheritance. We should not take it for granted. Not long ago, I brought a woman to the mikvah for conversion her fiancé was there, and his aunt came as a representative of the greater family to support her. That aunt was curious. She'd never been to a mikvah before. At first, she was tentative about the ceremony. But to her surprise, she wept uncontrollably, taken aback by how overcome she was, not even understanding where all the emotion came from. She said, those waters stand for something. Those waters teach me not to take my Judaism for granted. And so she was brought 
a little closer through that convert. Too often it's true that Jews by choice, people who work hard, study hard, pray hard to claim Judaism for themselves, are not fully recognized as authentically Jewish. And that is an embarrassment for whoever might whisper things like that or even think them. I think such skepticism is rooted only in lack of self-confidence. If only we took mitzvot and matters of dignity and spiritual expression as seriously as those who choose to become Jewish. One example out of many. You know about Birthright Israel and the young people who travel to Israel. And they can have two parents who are Jewish, one parent who is Jewish. We just want them to go and experience Israel and be charged by what they see there. So surveys done and studies done by participants of Birthright show, here's how it goes. The question is asked, do you light candles regularly on Shabbat in your home? And you can probably guess the answer. When they broke down the young people into those who are born of two born Jews, those who are born to one Jew and one non-Jew, and those who are born to one born Jew and one convert, which category do you think lights candles most regularly on Shabbat? The last group. That's right. It's very telling. There is in our daily prayer, in our weekday Amidah, a prayer in which we count the converts among the tzaddikim of the world. You are the righteous ones. You are named B'nai Avraham Visara. You have a direct line to the first Jewish mother and father. And today, good people, we express our sincere admiration and gratitude to you. We ask for God's blessing upon you with the words of our Sidur, Al HaTzadikim Ve'al HaChasidim Ve'al Ziknei Amcha Beit Yisrael Over the righteous and over the pious and over the elders of our people, the House of Israel, over the remnant of the scholars and over the Gerei Tzedek, over the true converts and over us all, may God's mercy well up. Baruch atah Adonai, mish'an umiftach latzadikim, Praised are you, Adonai, who is the support and the trust of the righteous. The second circle of people I wish to acknowledge today are the non-Jews who have attached themselves to our congregation. Probably because you fell in love with a Jew, you were introduced to a crazy family. <laughs> and then to a crazy people. And God bless you, you didn't run. That in and of itself is admirable. Today, on behalf of the congregation, I wish to thank you sincerely for supporting your Jewish partner and for supporting our congregation. And to those non-Jews who have made the serious commitment to raising Jewish children, there are not enough words to thank you. In the context of the history of the Jewish people, you are extraordinary. You are a rare minority. I don't know the Canadian equivalent, but demographic studies from south of the border tell us that only one third of interfaith couples raise Jewish kids. We cannot afford that statistic. And so those of you who are a part of an interfaith family and have made your way to Holy Blossom Temple somehow, and you say, yes, I will help to raise Jewish kids and build a Jewish home, God bless you. In my 18 years as a rabbi, I have come to appreciate that this is not easy. Some of you have made painful sacrifice. You have given up the joy of sharing your own spiritual practice, religious traditions with your children. 
Being Jewish is time consuming and expensive and you support your partner in that. Today we acknowledge how you schlep your kids to religious school or to Jewish day school. How you learn a new vocabulary, maybe a little Yiddish here and there. Maybe awkward Hebrew during our services, you endure it. And you know the rhythm of the Jewish calendar. You bring Shabbat and holidays into your homes. You might learn to make a good kugel or even to like gefilte fish. You come to services and you wonder, where am I in all of this? How do I fit in? I hope that answers come that are affirming for your decision. And I hope that you find that your efforts, small, medium, and large, are rewarding in many ways. When you stand with your son or your daughter, when he or she comes to this bima to read from the Torah for the first time, you share wholeheartedly in the pride of that moment. And I pray that you have found in Jewish life a source of joy that you also treasure. And because today is a day for telling the whole truth and being unafraid in speaking our truth, I'd like to also extend an open invitation to you, to the non-Jews among us, who have attached yourselves to the Jewish people. This invitation I offer has no expiration date. And that is that if at any time you have a hunch that you might like to explore the option of becoming Jewish yourself, we have three rabbis with open doors. And we are good listeners. And we can be good resources for you. I say this without an ounce of pressure or expectation. Judaism is not a proselytizing religion. You can come to us privately, and we will keep your confidences if you are not ready to share the conversation with your loved ones. I say this because I've come to appreciate that sometimes people are waiting to be asked. So the invitation stands, and please pass it along if it might be helpful to someone you know. It can take years for the time to feel right when one might say to himself or herself, I think I want to claim this identity, this Jewish identity for my own. But when that time comes, please know it doesn't come like an epiphany. Don't wait for that. It comes, I think, more like putting a piece of a puzzle into place. Or more simply, I've heard it described like a homecoming. Those who choose to be Jewish and those who support Jewish families can be like a mirror for those of us who were born into the tradition. We look at you and we ask, do we have the same commitment? Do we have the same skin in the game? Have we been as thoughtful and as deliberate in our choices? I share with you six questions that sometimes I, I offer when I meet with uh, candidates for conversion. And I hope that we can answer yes to every one of these questions. It can be a springboard for conversation. Do you choose to enter the eternal covenant between God and the people Israel? And do you choose to become a Jew by your own free will? Do you accept Judaism to the exclusion of all other religious faiths and practices? Do you pledge your loyalty to Judaism and to the Jewish people under all circumstances? Do you promise to establish a Jewish home and to practice to participate actively in the life of the synagogue and in the Jewish community? Do you commit yourself to the pursuit of Torah and Jewish knowledge? And number six, if you should be blessed with children, do you promise to raise them as Jews? The sentiments I bring to this sanctuary today are not new. For as long as I've been here, and many years before, Holy Blossom Temple has been 
encouraging and welcoming of converts and interfaith families. What has changed, I believe, in recent years is we are acutely aware of the power of a warm welcome and an open spirit. And I also pick up this theme today because the High Holy Days are when we all, every Jew, no matter how we got here, no matter the journey, these are the days when we recommit and say, I choose this. These 10 days of repentance now are immersive, like the mikvah waters. Mikvah means hope, tikva. Let these high holy days buoy us like the waters of the mikvah, buoy us with hope. And let us immerse ourselves in these days. Let us be washed clean, purified of our transgressions. Let us immerse ourselves in the waters of change. Let us feel ourselves weightless, by the confessions we make to our God during these days. And as if underwater, let us be more aware of our heartbeat, of what it is to be alive, and the opportunities of this good life. Let us hear the call of the shofar asking us to come to the surface again, so that we can be restored to our truest selves. And when we emerge from the waters, let us recommit to newfound identity, reinforced commitment. Let us emerge from these holy days refreshed and drenched in the love of our God and of our people. Amen.